This is quite a long class on the topic of research methodology. I'd expect you to stop the class many times over and make your own notes. Um, do some research into the areas and fill out your own notes based on what is on the video perhaps. But um, it's quite a long one so uh, feel free to stop the video, rewind it, play it forward again and so on. Um, it's an important topic so we need to go through it and we need to be familiar with a lot of the ideas in here. So we start with um, methodology. Now in a typical uh, research methodology paper we would expect to find uh, sections on areas like this. We'd expect to find something on the sampling design the research design itself, the data collection, the data analysis, the limitations of the whole exercise, the limitations of the analysis, the findings, the conclusions, the recommendations, the appendices, the bibliography, and a possible project outline at the very end. So we'd expect to find those, those headings to appear in the research project. And what I'm going to do in, in this video is to go across these, these headings and fill out more detail about them. As I said, quite a long video, so please stop it from time to time, have a break, come back to it. You can make a note of where you've stopped by looking at the slide number on the bottom right hand side of the, the screen. So you can resume from, from that point. Anyway, let's start by looking at the sampling design. In this section of a research project the target population should be discussed together with the sampling method to be used. So the sample population should be discussed and what method, the appropriate method for sampling should be selected and discussed in here. It should also contain an account of the types of sampling to be used, for example um, probability sampling, uh, simple random sampling or more complex random sampling techniques. A random sample is where each item selected from the population has an equal probability of being selected. So there's no bias in the selection. We also have non-probability sampling, quota sampling or snowball sampling. These are dealt with in separate videos but uh, they're really matters of convenience. Uh, they're, they're cheap but they're not very scientific and the results cannot be relied upon very strongly. I should also discuss the sample size of course. Uh, the sample size is important as to whether uh, it's small or large. If it's a large population then the sample should not be less than 30 uh, as, as a rule of thumb but ideally the more the better. The required level of confidence uh, how confident do, uh, do the, the researchers want to be in the results and that's a function of the size of the sample the more selected the more confident they can be in the results and also of course the, the sampling technique if it's random sampling that would yield fairly good results now let's go through um, go through these again we'll talk about the research project now the results should be as objective as possible that is an absolute truth. The results should be objective, they should not contain the opinions of the researcher and they should not be biased in, lines, in line with what the researcher thinks ought to have happened. The researcher's opinions and attitudes towards the topic being researched are irrelevant. It is the respondents that are important. So in here there should be a discussion of the rationale for the design research design. Why was the particular research design selected? The design of questionnaires are interview questions and strategy. 
the design of the questionnaire, if a questionnaire is going to be used, is very important. And it's not one that can be knocked off very quickly. It's one that takes a lot of thinking. The design has to be appropriate. Are there closed questions, open-ended questions, the sequence of the questions, the wording of the questions to make sure there's no bias? There should be also piloted to make sure that the questions are clear and can be understood and that the researcher can navigate the, the document easily when conducting the, the questionnaire, when conducting the, the survey. That's a, a major topic. The process of pilot testing to check the robustness of the process. Pilot testing is very important because it, it irons out issues, it irons out criticisms and problems. So it is very important. The method of data analysis may influence the research design. So it depends on how the the data is going to be analysed. Uh, if it's going to be analysed, for example, by computer, then the answers ideally should be quantifiable. Now, in terms of measuring attitudes, the researcher may use what's known as a Likert scale, which is an attitude scale ranging from, let's say, uh, 0 to 5, let's say where 0 is strongly disagree and 5 is strongly agree. So if somebody gave it a, a 2 then they strongly then they, they disagree. They're not strongly disagree but they disagree. So 0 is strongly disagree, 5 is strongly agree, 2 would be disagree. But it perhaps it's quantifiable. Generally speaking the use of quantification techniques when dealing with things like attitude is at best uh, hit and miss. It's not, a, it's not a really great thing to do. The data sources. Well, uh, the type and characteristic of the interviewees, if people are going to be interviewed, what, um, what are their characteristics? What, what, what sort of people are they? Uh, that's important perhaps because there may be even a cultural issue in the questions that are going to be posed and how they're going to be posed. Um, there's also an issue about how much primary and secondary sources of data will be used. Um, primary data is data collected for the purpose, data collected by the the surveyor. Secondary sources are published data, data published by perhaps by the government. And there is an interplay here between primary and secondary as to which one is most appropriate. There's also an issue of quantifiable and non-quantifiable data. Um, some things can be quantified, can be measured. Um, temperature can be measured. We have, a, we have scales for measuring temperature. Um, incomes can be measured. We have a unit for measurement. We have a the currency. The unit is the currency. Some things can't be quantifiable. People's opinions perhaps cannot be quantifiable. Their opinions about government policy or their opinions about the local football club. Uh, it's difficult to quantify. Well, impossible. The strength of feeling can't be gauged as well. How strongly do they hold these beliefs? The use of attitudinal scales, as I mentioned earlier, the Likert scale, for example, and other techniques of measurement, um, these are fine. Uh, they're, they're used widely in the social sciences and in business. But you have to remember that it's not a precise science. Given someone a scale and saying zero is strongly disagree and five is strongly agree, or whatever the scale is, that does not mean that people's uh, opinions are going to be quantifiable in their minds when they say, "Oh, it's a it's a two, or it's a it's a three. Uh, is it a two or a three? Um, it's not quantifiable in the same way as 
measuring weights or measuring the temperature. So there are issues with attitudinal measurements. Measurements looking for opinions. Measurements uh, of opinions, I should say. And of course, coding data. How do we code quantifiable and non-quantifiable data? How do we, how do we code non-quantifiable? Where uh, people's opinions are sought regarding a certain topic. Probably the best way to do it would be open-ended question, get their opinions and uh, make a judgment about the, the strength of feeling and what was said overall about that. Perhaps that's the best way to go. But to quantify it for um, analysis may be very, very difficult, if not impossible. So there might be a coding issue. The research design section should contain a self-critique. This is usually under the heading of strengths and weaknesses. Um, there should be um, a section in the research design which enables the researcher to set out the criticisms of the technique to show that he or she is aware that there are issues and there are problems, perhaps problems that can't be solved, but nonetheless the technique is going to be applied. Just to show that there are problems here. And the copies of materials used and the technical details should be placed in the appendix of the project. Um, as far as possible the appendices should show the, the materials that were used and indicate perhaps if it's a survey, if it's um, non-confidential, where the surveys could be looked at, where, where they could be consulted where uh, the details coming back from the respondents are kept. That depends on confidentiality, of course. OK, so data collection. The management decision-making is facilitated by the use of primary research. Management needs to have good information about its product, let's say if it's a company, about its product, its production, its perception in the marketplace. And the best way to do that is through primary research. Go out and ask the customer, ask the clients directly. That's primary research. It's not picking up published data by the government or by any other agency. It's doing it yourself. Going out and asking the customer, asking the clients, what do they think of the product or of the company? Now this may be a detailed market research, including market surveys, it may be, or it may be something less. It may be just going to a selected number of, in, of uh, clients, perhaps randomly selected from the, the client base. Secondary data may be used by business competitors. Um, business competitors will have the same access to secondary data as everyone else. So there's no advantage in using secondary data. That's why primary data is so important. Collecting the data in-house is important because that's what gives the uniqueness. That's what gives a better understanding of what the clients think about the products. Secondary data is available to everyone so the, the competitors can get secondary data the same as the business can. In the data collection, this section should provide information on the data sources and selected methods of analysis to be used. So the data sources should be identified here and the methods of analysis should be also discussed. So the sources of data and the methods are discussed in this section. And there should be some justification for the selected methods. Why, why use a particular method as opposed to some other method? Uh, why is that? Why is that being selected? So it's justifying the whole process. The amount of data collected should reflect the level of significance required. 
uh, if it's important to have accurate detailed information then a good size sample may be required. The bigger the sample the more accurate the information is regarding the population. So it depends on how accurate the the business wants the information. If it if it needs detailed information that's accurate with a high degree of confidence then it has to be a large sample size collected randomly. Finally the validity and reliability of the data should be considered. We'll have a few words about these. Um, first of all the validity. This refers to whether a, a study me uh, measures or examines what it claims to measure or examine. So the survey should study what it says it is going to study. Questionnaires may lack validity for a number of reasons. Respondents may lie, give answers that are desired and so on. It is argued that quantitative data is more valid uh, than uh, qualitative data. Um, validity in uh, surveys is very important. The validity indicates that the survey is measuring what it claims to have measured. Uh, it examines what it claims to have measured. So th there are obstacles in collecting data. Uh, respondents may tell lies or may mislead or, or may not know and give a false answer. Sometimes they mislead by simply not thinking about the question in detail and given an inaccurate response. But whatever. If that happens, the survey is checking something else. So the validity of the exercise comes into question. Is it a valid survey? Now, valid means it should do what it says it's going to do. Reliability. Well, reliability refers to how consistent a measuring device is. I mean, that's how uh, in engineering even, even uh, tools, the reliability of something is measured by uh, how reliable the instruments for measuring are. A measurement is said to be reliable or consistent if the measurement can be can produce similar results, results if used again in similar circumstances. So reliability means that if the survey was conducted again would it produce the same results? If it did then that's reliable. But if a survey is conducted and it produces a set of results and if it was conducted again then and it produced a completely different set of results, you'd have to explain why they were completely different. Was it because of a time delay? Did something change in the meantime? Does something, does something account for the, the change between the two sets of results? If it does, fine. But if you can't account for the differences, then it's not reliable. Reliability means that the survey, if it's conducted over and over and over, will produce the same sets of results over and over and over. The limitations of the survey. Well, the selected methodology should be discussed critically and its limitations carefully explored. This shows professionalism and honesty. It acknowledges the shortcomings of the research. It's very important that the work is honest and it also appears honest to be honest. Um, honest means that the methodology used should be critical. Critical in the sense that it should criticize itself, it should discuss its shortcomings, its limitations. Don't wait for the reader to develop the criticisms. Develop the criticisms in the work itself and discuss how important the limitations are. How limiting are the limitations? 
Findings. This section should set out uh, the findings as facts. The analysis will be completed in a full analysis section later in the project. So the findings should set out the facts of what was found. As to why those facts apply or were found, that will be looked at in the analysis section later, but the findings just produce the facts. Um, they should be clearly drawn and they should uh, indicate or they should show where the supporting evidence is. So the findings should be produced and it should be based on evidence, evidence from the survey. It's not as if the, the writer has license to just make up or construct some sort of finding. That's not, that's not acceptable. The writer must base the findings, each of them, on the evidence. Quantitative findings may be illustrated by graphs and charts and tables or whatever is most appropriate. They don't have to be written. So um, various techniques may be used for presenting the, the, uh, the data. Finally, some mention of the limitations should be restated in summary form. The findings have been produced, but um, some qualifications as to why the findings may not be entirely accurate should be written down as well. This is the, the limitations part we discussed earlier, but do it in summary form. Just mention here again that there are limitations so that the findings should not be uh, accepted carte blanche. Now the conclusions. Well, the conclusions should be based entirely on the findings. These must be presented in the work and not left to the reader to do. So the, the conclusions must be worked out from the findings and based entirely on the findings. Nothing else. Anything else would be biased and would be inappropriate. The conclusions must be based on the findings. And the conclusions must be clear so that the reader can just read over them and the work is done for the reader. The reader doesn't have to try and sort out what the conclusions are from the findings, him or herself. The work is done in the project. The findings are used in conjunction with the research hypothesis to draw the conclusion. Essentially, either the, the, the findings, I should say, should either confirm or reject the hypothesis. So the work started with some sort of uh, objective, some sort of hypothesis, to test the relationship between something and something else, to test whether this product was acceptable in the market, to test whether the price was appropriate to bring about certain results, or whatever the hypothesis is. Now having conducted the survey and having got findings, albeit with limitations, the findings have yielded conclusions, again limitations. Now the conclusions indicate whether the hypothesis should be accepted or rejected. Was the hypothesis correct or wrong? And that's the whole purpose of the exercise. However, the discussion should recognize explicitly the limitations of the work and the possibility of erroneous conclusions. So all sorts of qualifications about the limitations should be written down. And this means that the reader understands that although the conclusion seems to uh, suggest that the hypothesis has been accepted or rejected as the case may be, uh, there are limitations to this. There are, it may be erroneous, there may be problems, and it's, it's important that the, the reader understands the limitations as well as the conclusions. Finally, a brief overall summary of the work may be presented. 
so a brief outline of the work could be presented at the end. Now the recommendations. Well, these include statements suggesting improvements that may be made to subsequent work. So if the whole exercise was done again, how could it be improved? What did the researchers learn from the activity, uh, from the whole process, and what changes could be made to make it a better exercise the next time round? Uh, this section should only be included if requested or if it's customary in this type of work. Um, for example, in academic research, uh, most of it does not have recommendations. Recommendations tend to be associated with reports and research conducted for companies on specific issues where recommendations may be used to polish future work. But for um, research work in academic institutions, uh, the, the methodology is the scientific method, generally speaking, and that's well understood by academics, so the recommendations are, are not necessarily uh, important to them. Uh, if it is concluded, it, uh, if it is included, it may bias the interpretation uh, of the overall conclusion. So you have to be careful by making recommendations. It, it may actually influence the way people see the overall conclusion of the project. If it's not included, it may miss an opportunity to pass on valuable insights and recommendations related to this type of research. As I said, it's more, more important in the case of uh, company reports and company pieces of research than it is in others, e.g. academic work, for example. Now the appendices. Well, appendices are an optional component of the, the work. They're used to present material used, but difficult for the general reader to find. So when material is discussed and the general reader can't find that work, can't find where the original source was, sometimes a copy of the original is included in the appendices. They may also clarify parts of discussion uh, with material that's relevant but not central to discussion. Uh, for example, if there was some complicated calculation and some proof perhaps of a particular calculation that was needed. Uh, instead of cluttering up the main work with the, the mathematics of this, it may be included as one of the appendices. Um, so sometimes material which is referred to could be worked on in the appendices and the relationships could be short, sorted out there. It just means that the main work itself is easy to read. Generally the appendices contain the following information. They contain, uh, may include, or may include, I should say, sorry, they may include raw data. Uh, if it's a, a questionnaire, this does not mean it includes all of the questionnaires, perhaps, but uh, it may indicate where the questionnaires are kept and may be consulted. Um, it depends, of course, entirely on whether the exercise was confidential or not confidential and whether the respondents had given permission for this to happen. Uh, there are issues associated with research involving the permission of the respondents. If the respondents objected to this, then that could not, that could not be made available for inspection later. Clearly it would be better if they were available for inspection to make sure that the whole process was above board. Detailed calculations, as, as I said, that would complicate and confuse the main work, well they may be included in the appendices. Um, pictorial data including graphs, charts, diagrams, tables, photographic, photographic images, so on, they may be included in the appendices it may include some sort of electronic storage medium which has video or whatever. 
so it depends on what it is but they may be included in whatever format there as well um, copies of forms and questionnaires would be included to show what was asked and how it was worked out instructions to field workers if field workers were involved that is um, so instructions as to how the questionnaire or the survey was conducted these might be included as well um, and always ensure that the appendices are appropriately referenced within the main body of the work the referencing scheme used in this type of work should ideally be the Harvard referencing system which is the subject of a separate video um, the appendices should be ref should be referenced carefully in the main body, so it's easy to find uh, way around the appendices. It's easy to find the sources of information in the appendices as well. Now the bibliography. Well, in alphabetic an alphabetic list of citations or references to the sources used throughout the research may be included here. In other words it's an alphabetic list of the sources that are used. Uh, if it's books it would be by author, uh, by surname first and the surnames would be organized alphabetically. Um, so try to get some order into it, make it logical so that skimming down the bibliography would find, uh, the reader would find it easy to find the material Um, it may be preferable to leave this and present the references in the work's main bibliography instead. Um, so instead of presenting it in the uh, research part, having a bibliography in the research part, it might be better just to, to leave it and include it in the main work's bibliography. Don't forget we're here we're talking about the research part of the, the main work. So uh, it may be that these, these references could be produced later in the main part. Let's try and get an overview of what we've just talked about. That may look intimidating and probably it is intimidating but in fact <laughs> if you look at the, arrow, uh, the arrows here they do come across to uh, 11 goes to 11, 10 to 10, 9 to 9, 8 to 8, uh, 7 goes to 5, the findings which go into the data section and the, the sample design which goes into the methodology. So that would be um, a reasonable approximation for where the information fit. But essentially what we're talking about here is a section in a main report. This is the research section and these are the issues that have to be concerned or have to be dealt with and concerned with in the uh, research section. And that's about it. That's all we need to do in this section. Uh, so let's leave it at that. Thank you for watching.